Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Higher Education Tableau User Group January meeting. And despite the fact that it says it's 2021 on our slide, I hope you all have gotten used to putting 2022 on all your paperwork now. It always takes me about a month or so. Anyway, so to, on today's agenda, we are going to um, have announcements. This is when I invite you to come off of mute, share any announcements that you might have, any job openings. If uh, you don't feel like coming off mute, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat box and also share them on our Slack group. We have a whole channel dedicated to open positions at different schools. I also believe we'll be sharing our link to join the Slack channel if you haven't already done so. So after our announcements, we're going to meet a community member that will be Roy Lee from NYU Stern, followed by tips and tricks um, by Anna, I'm not gonna butcher your last name, from Duke. And then we have driving decision support within research administration. Uh, that's going to be presented by Alex Dixon from University of Kentucky. And at the end, we'll have our wrap up and our optional breakout rooms to network and chat with each other. All right, so if anyone has announcements, here's your chance. I'll give you just a minute to come off mute. So it looks like we have a position posted in the, in the chat. Uh, there's a Tableau manager role at Vanderbilt. Uh, the Great. link is there. There's one at Kofi, the consortium for finance or of financing higher education, if I remember that correctly. Uh, also, they also have a position. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. All right, well, without any further ado, I guess we'll jump right into our Meet a Community member for January. Welcome back, Roy Lee from NYU Stern School of Business. You may remember Roy from our um, was our December meeting, Roy? Yep. All right, well, he gave us a fabulous presentation. And today we're going to be learning a little bit more about him personally. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. You're gonna have uh, about 15 minutes or so to share your responses, and then we'll have our lightning round at the end. All right, so Roy, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your role and your team? Great. Well, um, thank you again. Uh, so uh, a little background about myself. So I've been uh, in education for, I think, about, uh, oh, my God, like 20, 20 some odd years now. Uh, for most of that, I've been at NYU Stern, um, the, business, uh, the business school at NYU. And for most of my career, um, I've been on the business side of the house, uh, leading our executive programs group focused on admissions curriculum and sort of program development uh, and recruitment exec ed, that type of thing. Uh, only in the last two or three years, I took a, on a new role at the school, uh, overseeing the school's uh, data and analytics efforts. Um, and that was sort of a new one at NYU as well, sort of a newly created role. Uh, in terms of my role and my team's role, um, I, it's really broken out into like two parts. I think the first, is really around getting people data. So that involves us rebuilding uh, data architecture so that we can get data to our people on a self-service and on-demand way, uh, reducing those barriers that it takes time from getting, uh, re reducing the barriers that takes time from getting decisions from data. So uh, for us, we're leveraging Salesforce to do this and it fits really nicely with Tableau since uh, they're, all part of the same family. The second part of my role uh, is now that we have data, what do we do with it? So uh, it's working with teams to evangelize uh, data and analytics, working with teams on projects, uh, building skill sets so that uh, we can all be become more decision centric. And this is where, of course, Tableau is a huge part of that and really getting teams to understand data, data structure, but also to think and become more analytically focused. And that kind of leads right into my next question, which is what types of data do you work with? 
So um, one of the roles that I uh, enjoy the most when I sort of shifted to this uh, sort of overarching school uh, sort of uh, role is that I work with a lot of different teams with a lot of different uh, data sets and that always keeps things really interesting. So I've worked with uh, marketing data to do some like attribution modeling, admissions data, like with some yield analysis. Um, but most recently, a lot of the data that I've been working on recently is uh, our faculty teaching data, um, and particularly around understanding faculty performance. And, you know, the Tableau prep from about a month ago, um, I kind of walked through how we use prep to sort of work with some faculty data to understand metrics a little bit more. And can you tell us a little bit more about how you use Tableau at work? Yeah, uh, so I think Tableau for me, um, you know, is always the beginning of the analytics process. So um, a lot of it I use as sort of uh, to do data exploration. I do a lot of visualizations to get a feel of the data set. Uh, oftentimes I'm starting with, especially data set, especially if it's very new to me, because for example, prior to working with faculty data, didn't really know anything about faculty data. So I would put it into Tableau, uh, being able to do some basic charts to get a feel of like the distributions, looking at understanding outliers. And then oftentimes when I'm doing something a little bit more deeper in terms of statistical modeling, I'll go to R. Um, I haven't yet learned uh, I know that there's an R Tableau connector. That's something that uh, you know I want to learn more about. I I know of it, but I haven't really worked or experienced in it. But it's something that like I think would be helpful since I I know both. But a lot of the the work in Tableau is exploratory, I guess, in that sense. Awesome. Um, before I forget, check the chat box after we're done chatting because uh, there are some questions from the audience that you may want to follow up on. Anywho, I'll circle back. Um, what is your favorite Tableau project that you've ever worked on? So um, I think um, the favorite Tableau project, I think uh, when I was thinking about this is um, a project that I worked on early during the COVID lockdown. And I read a post from uh, Ken Furwich, who um, I follow a lot. And uh, I know that he's been in part of this for, uh, user group and also he was at the higher ed um, conference just recently, but he wrote, had a blog about how to build a social distancing floor plan in Tableau. And I followed his walkthrough to do the same thing for our classrooms so that we can see what the new capacity or seat capacity was for our classrooms giving social distancing. And it was the first time I was, I had the experience of being able to download an image, use X, Y coordinates, dens densification and that sort of thing. But I think more importantly, reading it, what he's done, like it was such a clever way of being able to use Tableau sort of out of the box thinking that um, it was something that I just really enjoyed doing. But again, all credit to Ken because I just followed his recipe. And uh, but it was really fun to work with because it's something I've never really done before. So, um, but it's a great example. If anybody needs to do it, go to his blog. It's awesome. Awesome. Um, so, how long have you been using Tableau? So I've been using um, Tableau. I think about six to seven years right now. Um, I, I uh, learned it through uh, a grad program through Stern uh, around business analytics. So it was my first introduction uh, to it. Um, and then a lot of it after that is just self-teaching, like YouTube videos and Ken's blog, for example, all that sort of thing. I think a lot of us are in that boat. Uh, do you have a favorite Tableau feature? Um, so, you know, I was trying to think of like, what was my like favorite Tableau feature, but I, I think the, the one, it might be a simple one, but I really loved it when it came out. I think it was like a couple years ago, but Viz Animations, uh, I think when it came out, like just the look and feel of how your, or your dashboards like moved, um, it really added or enhanced, especially for like leadership who were just more like the moving pictures and like how everything fit. It was really nice for them, but I, I really liked how those motions work. So that was really Definitely. Nice. Is there something in Tableau that you want to learn more about? 
Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned before, uh, I think the R connector is something that I, I know exists. I've never really seen it. I want to learn more about how to use uh, both of them together. I think that's something that um, I think would just be helpful because I often go to one or the other. I'm not sure how it works together, but that's something I would love to learn. It's just like who has the time, but I guess I have to make the time. <laughs> Is there something you wish you could go back and tell Tableau newbie you? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, when I was thinking about this, I think uh, one of the things I probably would tell myself if, in hindsight would be like, don't get ahead of yourself. I think when I first learned, like really stopped to learn the fundamentals, like when I first was introduced, I think I was introduced to Tableau, I went right to the public gallery viz and I was like, oh man, look at all these cool like, uh, dashboards, look at all these visas. And, uh, you know, I try to get there very quickly. So I think in a lot of ways, I made some shortcuts with like calculations and that sort of thing, kind of hack my way through together. And uh, that caused problems later on, like when I was like, trying to make a dashboard more sustainable or repeatable. And I think if I could have like, told myself, I probably would have been like, look, I know you want to do this, but maybe just stick to the fundamentals, really understand what like an include is versus an exclude or a fixed so that in the future, you don't have to like spend all this time and you find you messed something up because you hacked together a calculation that worked one time, but doesn't work for another time. I think you should tell Tableau newbie me that too. <laughs> is there anything else you wanna share before we jump into the lightning round? Um, no, I think the only thing I would share is like, um, this is such a, you know, a great community. I, you know, I think for all of you guys who are organizing it, you know, totally appreciative, but all the community members to, you know, find a way to get engaged is such a great resource. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity and for uh, allowing all the speakers to be able to have a forum to share some of the work that they're doing. It's great. Well. If that's it all for now, uh, I think we're ready for the lightning round. You have one minute to answer as many questions as you can. Are you ready? I'm ready, I think so. <laughs> all right, Red Sox or Yankees? So um, neither, Mets, the long forgotten New York team. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll give you that one. Um, New Year's resolutions, yes or no? Uh, no, not a big fan. Winter or summer? Summer. I hear you. Uh, so you got your MBA at the University of Rochester, and now you're NYU. So would you pick Rocky the Yellow Jacket or the NYU Bobcat? I think I've been in New York more than I have been in Rochester now in this time of my life. So I'd say uh, NYU Bobcat. <laughs> East River or Hudson River? I used to live right next to the Hudson River, so Hudson River. Nice. Uh, what's your favorite borough? Queens, most diverse borough. <laughs> What's your uh, favorite bridge or tunnel or MTA route? Oh, this is similar to like the Yankees and uh, Red Sox. Neither. It just reminds me of traffic and congestion. <laughs> Can deal with none of them. <laughs> uh, Tableau prep or Tableau desktop? Prep. It's uh, amazing. Well, when I've learned it, it's been an amazing tool. It is. Are you team floating or team tiles? So I'm floating. I really like the ability to be able to have the flexibility down to the pixel. Uh, sets or parameters? Parameters. Do you prefer a blizzard scatter plot or a snowman bubble chart? Love scatter plots, use them all the time. Great tool. <laughs> and last, uh, bullet chart or box and whisker plot? So bullet charts for sure, the number one chart when it comes to conveying simple information to your leadership. This The bar just needs to hit this line, that's all you need to know bullet charts for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roy. We really appreciate you being our community member this month. Thank you. All right. And I will turn it over to Roshni. So uh, just to follow up on the community member, if you want to be highlighted or spotlighted and, and are okay with being, you know, put on the spot, uh, let us know. Contact us uh, either through Slack um, or our email is going to be somewhere at near the end of the slides um, and let us know. We like asking people questions and I'm sure many of you data analysts also like, like hearing what people are saying. So, um, so yeah, 
So now uh, let's move on to tips and tricks. So uh, you might actually remember Anna from a prior Meet a Community member. Um, so Anna is at Duke. Uh, she recently-ish uh, moved into a data-based analyst role uh, at the uh, Office of the University Registrar. Um, and she offered to show us a really cool way uh, to look at parameters. And parameters, you know, Roy mentioned that they're his favorite. And I think most people that we've asked that question to throughout the Muni Community Member Spotlight have said parameters, definitely parameters. Um, and so, you know, the question of what, well, what is a parameter and how can I use it um, is one that, that probably comes next if you haven't used parameters. And Anna just has some really cool examples that are just really easy. It's, um, I kind of, I, when, I, when I saw her slides, I was like, this is like the, the, the gateway to, to more fancy things with parameters. Um, so, uh, Anna, if you wanna take it away, um, go ahead and share your slides and, and go. <laughs> Thank you, Roshni, and I, um, I echo that. What you just mentioned about the gateway. So let me go ahead and put my slides up. Slide mode, there we go. All right, uh, let me move this over there. Okay, so um, as I uh, mentioned previously, I am Anna Kulunyotis from um, Duke University, work at the Office of the University Registrar, uh, doing various stuff, um, some of the things with Tableau. Um, so what I'm here um, to present to you today will be um, a couple of, of tips and, and tricks for creating what are known as parameters um, in order to create a um, more of an engaged kind of experience um, for your users. Right, so this is a presentation legend of these different icons we're going to see along the way, just so you know what each one means. Um, and a side note here, um, I've shared this presentation PowerPoint with um, the team. And at some point, it will be made uh, available to the uh, general public as well. All right. So let's uh, let's start with what you know definitions. What is a parameter? I think um, many of us on this uh, group probably know what that is all about. But let's just uh, uh, go ahead and, and um, summarize. So parameters are, are used in order to add some advanced calculations and things inside your your dashboards. Um, it allows users to replace values with particular filters, calculations, or even reference lines. Why use them? Well, to give power, more power to your users in order to allow them to change the way that they view things on their dashboards. And an additional thing, or rather factor that I use it for is to save space on my dashboards. All right, so I, I put together um, two scenarios. I, I know I only have about uh, 14 minutes to share everything. So in case I don't get to scenario two, it is included in, in this PowerPoint slide uh, for everybody to kind of go back and, and look at all the different steps. So I'm going to start with uh, the first scenario, which is going to illustrate how um, a user can switch between two different aggregations, totals versus averages, on a single dashboard. All right, so um, this is our objective. This is what we want to see. Uh, it basically shows a dashboard um, with a drop down menu on the top right. When a user selects something from that menu, um, one of the items, it um, automatically switches that view to the relevant aggregation in the selected sheet. All right, so we have two working sheets that I'm going to um, flip over to that tableau right now to show everybody how that is kind of working with that scheme here. All right. So I, I take it that everybody's still seeing my, my Tableau screen here, correct? You're good. Excellent. Okay. So um, this is the dashboard that will eventually include the, um, the two different views that I have saved within uh, the workbook. Um, so let's go over the step. So step number one would be to uh, go ahead and create those two uh, different views that you would like your user to be able to flip from you know, one view to the other. Um, and so I'm using enrollment data. This is the information that I typically um, work with at Duke. Um, so my first view shows the total enrollment trend over, over years for a particular um, department or area. The second view um, is a, a bar graph that shows the average enrollment by class. Um, again, for this particular department in question. So first thing first, right, so you, you've created your two basic views and then you could have the, the dashboard already previously created that I have done so already here. Um, so that's step one. Step two would be to go ahead and create the parameter. 
Um, so the reason you need, so when you create that parameter, it's basically going to um, allow you to, to view it within your, your given views. They could be two, they could be three, they could be multiple, depending on how many options you want to give your users to, to change what they're saying. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started there. So right clicking in the space, select create parameter. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a name. And the name that I will give uh, at this point will be viewable to the user. So I'm going to say choose rather aggregation, choose aggregation. You could say choose view, choose bar graph, choose type of chart is completely up to you. And then the data type for this example will be string. I'm leaving the current value in place and selecting the allowable values to list. And at this point, I am going to go ahead and um, insert the values that I want the user to be able to choose from. So, I mean, you can, you can do, you know, you can start with a number and then display that number uh, or choose the label that you want the, the viewer to see. Um, I, sometimes it de depends on how many um, values you have in your list. Sometimes it might be easier to go ahead and um, enter numerical values. Um, at other times it's, you know, if you have very few, uh, in, in our case, we're gonna have only two, two choices. Um, I like to go ahead and just insert the, um, the actual value as, it, as I want it to show up in that drop-down menu later on. So option number one, total enrollment. Option number two, average enrollment. If I could type, that would help. All right, and at this point I'm done and I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. I see that the parameter has been inserted in the bottom left-hand corner of our um, data, data pane. And um, I, again, I'm in the total enrollment uh, view. Uh, the parameter has been created and can be used in both of the views so that we are done with step number two. Step number three would be to go ahead and show the parameter at this stage. So as soon as I do that, it actually goes ahead um, and populates to the right-hand side. I like to flip it over to the left because I can um, I can work a little easier this way. So if you go ahead and you um, you click on our drop-down menu and you switch it, you see the two di different values that we have inserted in the parameter. Um, if you go ahead and make a selection, nothing really happens at this point. So you know you, I'm flipping the switch, but nothing is happening. Um, for this parameter to be applied onto the the view, we're going to have to go ahead and create a calculated field at this stage. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. I'm going to bring this over here. There we go. Then I give it a name. And it really doesn't matter what kind of name, what name you are giving it, since this is only viewable by you. Um, this calculated view information will not be viewed by the user. Um, and the point of this um, calculated field is basically to go ahead, very simple, really, um, choose the parameter that you've just created. So I'm going to go ahead and type in choose aggregation. And I, I do enjoy making little notes inside all the calculations that I've created, following best practices that a lot of the, most of the gurus are, if not all, are using. Um, and anybody who has coded in different languages um, as well, probably a fan of using these little comments so that you know what the heck it is that you're doing with all these uh, calculations. Okay, so I'm pretty much done at this, at this stage. All right, so I got my calculated field, I have my parameter. So the next step um, would be to drag and drop that newly created calculated field into the filter shelf um, in our first view. Okay, and you'll see that um, from the two different, oh, I forgot to do something there, pardon me, I'm gonna cancel out on this one. See what I did. Actually, that was a good example. So what I did previously was I was showing you that if you select your aggregation from total back to average, nothing happens apart from when it comes to it comes time for you to insert your calculated field, right? So make a note here. I am in the total enrollment view. I accidentally switched my um, aggregated value to average enrollment, which is actually um, tied to the second view over here. So if I go ahead and I insert my um, newly created calculated field in here, I see that I have average enrollment selected, which is not which is not correct. What I wanna see here is total enrollment because it's gotta jive with the view that I'm currently in. So I'm gonna cancel out of that one. 
and then flip back that parameter selection to total enrollment so that it is in line with the view that I'm in right now. Go back, enter a filter for the bar graph selection, click on total enrollment, and then click OK. All right, so that step is done. Um, the next step is to repeat all of this for the second view, average enrollment. And at this point, um, we have created the both the parameter and the calculated field, so we don't have to worry about recreating things from scratch. Um, and just as I did previously, I'm going to go ahead and um, show the parameter in this sheet as well. And this time, select average enrollment, bring over the calculated field filters, check the average enrollment option, which is the only one that should be available, and then click OK. All right. So now it's a uh, dashboard time. So go to your previously created dashboard, which I have done so already. Um, so there's just some basic information here um, about what the dashboard contains, um, some really basic instructions and definitions on the information that the user is, is um, going to see and what they're able to do. Um, what I did previously, you can do this afterwards, it's, it's completely up to you because I knew that I was going to go ahead and insert a um, parameter, kind of um, a drop-down menu um, based on a parameter. I went ahead um, and I inserted a floating image of a little arrow uh, pointer along with some text, which provides some really basic um, instructions to the user. So this is the area where I'm eventually um, going to insert the parameter. Um, so we've created the two views previously and we're going to insert them inside the, um, the dashboard. And the way to do this is um, by adding a, I'm gonna use a tile, horizontal or vertical is up to you object that will uh, basically contain those two dashboards. I'm going to bring in bring in the dashboard, the views, pardon me, one by one here, right next to each other. OK, so at this point in time, you'll see a couple things happening, right? The, this data looks like an utter mess. Uh, that's because there are a couple things. So the filters came up at the top I, for the instances of, of um, for the purposes of this um, Tutorial, I'm just going to get rid of that filter because we're not really going to filter on here. Um, you see that your parameter has actually been automatically selected for you and it's tiled, position tiled at the very top. I'm going to change that um, into a floating object because I do want to go ahead and place it where, where it makes sense for me. Right there and get rid of that additional layer. All right, so that's step number one. Put this wherever you feel like it's you know it's nicer for the user to look at. Step number two would actually um, be to um, get rid of the um, the titles or the headings of each of these views because what happens here is yes you can go back and forth on these two different aggregation levels or um, bar graph selections, but when you do that you know it creates a, a really a, a bad uh, user experience because you're seeing things that you should not be seeing at this point, right? So I'm in average, I'm in total enrollment, and then I'm seeing the average um, heading to the right, which does not make sense. So the way to correct this, um, and I do want to thank, I want to give a shout out to the data school, because I, I use a lot of the tutorials to, to build this presentation as well. Um, so what you do here is you go ahead and you remove the titles from both of these views. Right? And then when you go back and you make your selection, it updates the dashboard accordingly. So this, I love, I love parameters. I mentioned it in the, the previous time when I when I got the, the highlight, um, and I, I use these really really frequently for things that um, I do over here at Duke. Um, so on that note, I do have, um, but I think I do have like maybe four more minutes uh, to present this other. Um, option uh, really quickly. And for this one, I'm actually going to go back to my PowerPoint um, only because I, I you know, want to be aware and cognizant of the time that I have um, available. And so scenario two for using uh, parameters um, to create a, a better uh, user experience is um, you can do something called custom sorting by specific element and also add an ordering um, sequence. Um, I find this very, very useful um, for, especially for users who really want to manipulate their, their sorting orders on their different elements in the dashboards um, in, a, in a really customized way. 
So I'm gonna just uh, continue with the PowerPoint here. Um, so this is our objective. Um, there's some basic um, capacity rate data for, for history classes and the data here is, is fictitious um, that allows the user to sort on either term class or capacity number. Um, and then they're able to um, select a sorting order either by ascending or descending, depending on what element that they've chosen previously. Right, so, um, and I'm gonna go through these, uh, through these steps one by one, but the PowerPoint does include kind of like a, an overview of the process or the method. Um, so this is um, step number one, build a view as in a previous example, right? And then step number two would be to choose the, um, the sort and the order by your elements. So in this example, we've um, chosen to sort everything by term, class, and capacity. As we did previously, you create the parameter, right? You give it a, a kind of an understandable name. Um, and in this example, I actually went ahead and created my list of values based um, on certain numeric values and then displaying stuff um, in, a, in native language that the user can understand. So parameter has been created. Um, and next step would be to show that parameter as we did previously. Now the calculation that's been created um, in this very first stage is actually um, using a case statement, which is looking at the parameter values. And then it's saying that, you know, if the value is um, term or catalog number or um, capacity, then um, show that relevant element coming from, from your data. Right. And there are some helpful resources here that I've listed for everybody, um, uh, whether you're using a case or an if statement, either one works. I guess it's a matter of preference. Um, so moving on, next step would be to um, go ahead and this time you drag and drop the calculated field, not within the filter shelf, but on the row shelf itself. Um, and this is, the order is, is kind of important. Um, so when you go ahead and you drag that, um, that pill, uh, it, you'll need to change it over to a um, <clears throat> over to a dimension, and then drag that entire pill into the beginning of the rows and deselect the show header. So th these steps are important because for so you want to convert it to, the, to a dimension um, in order to remove the sum aggregation from the field. So you just want it to to be um, applicable in a way that will allow you to um, to do the to show the sorting and the ordering um, based on those values alone and not the aggregates of those values. Um, next, you need to create a second parameter which is dedicated to the sorting by ascending or descending order. And then you go ahead and you edit your um, pre-existing calculated field to include the sorting, right? So you basically need to wrap the, sort, wrap the sorting around your initial statement, your case or your if, um, in order to apply the, the ordering and the sequencing accordingly. And then you use the parameters to sort and order by everything that you've selected. So you just basically add them to your dashboard, floating or tile. And uh, there you have it, method illustrated completely. Thanks, Anna. That was awesome. These, like, like I mentioned earlier, these are sort of the the gateways to using parameters for for even more stuff. Um, and you know, once you get the the basics of this method down, you really, you know, you can go anywhere and do all sorts of of really cool things with parameters that go beyond just swapping or sorting, but you know, doing really complex things. So. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, there are a few more questions, uh, or there are a few questions in the in the chat for you, um, and we can also continue this conversation on Slack if you think that that would work better. Um, the slides from Anna's presentation will be on the the January meeting page, um, which I posted in the Slack later today. Uh, probably give me I don't know half an hour after the meeting <laughs> to get them down, um, but they'll they'll be up there uh, then. So, thank you, Anna. This was great. Um, if you have any uh, you know, tips and tricks that you want to share with the group, um, even if it's, you know, a five minute, hey, I found this neato thing, or I found a really cool way to use a case statement or to do a conversion between X and Y. We want to see it. We want to hear from you. Um, so feel free to get in touch with the higher ed uh, Tableau user group um, at our Gmail address, which will be posted later, or just reach out to us on Slack. Um, and we will see if we can get you into a future meeting. So thank you, Anna. That was great. <laughs> um, so now uh, we're gonna uh, actually uh, move on to
the next session, um, Alex Dixon from the University of Kentucky. Um, so Alex did a shorter version of this presentation. I think it was like, you know, it was part of a, a 20, 25 minute presentation split between two schools and then someone else was speaking in for part of the, the University of Kentucky session. So Alex is taking what was essentially like seven ish minutes and turning it into 20, 25 um, for us and giving us a, a deep dive into how uh, the research administration group or uh, at University of Kentucky um, has used Tableau. So um, Alex, if you want to take it away. Sure. Hi, so my name is Alex Dixon. I'm a decision support analyst at University of Kentucky for UK research. Um, so the presentation that I'm going to go through, it's kind of an abbreviated form of the presentation because I want to give you all more of like an in-depth, hands-on look at what we've created. Um, but it was done in partnership with my boss, uh, Baron Wolf. Um, and to give you some background on myself, because I think it's always interesting to hear the backgrounds of people who use Tableau. Um, Prior to joining the University of Kentucky, I'd never even heard of Tableau. Uh, most of my background is in project management, graphic design, user experience. Um, and I just happened to use a, one file or one workbook on Tableau server when I was a project manager here. Um, and our analytics lead at the time uh, just kind of took a chance on me and hired me. And then uh, Baron, who's now my boss, is one of my customers. And I came over to research and, you know, the rest is history. So. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Excellent. So um, again, this is just an abbreviated version of our um, presentation at Tableau Conference. Um, I can post the link in the Slack to our, our full session if you're interested. Um, but to kind of give you an idea of, let me minimize this. There we go. Uh, where we were at. So prior to my, my boss coming on board at the UK, this is kind of like what he was dealing with. So this is just a one page of 196 page PDF that was sent out to our um, research staff um, and leadership to let them know, you know, kind of the status of the um, grants and contracts that they're working on. Um, and as you can imagine, it's very inefficient. Um, it doesn't really show you anything that you can kind of like latch onto or look for trends in. Um, so after he was hired on, he was actually in the position that I'm in now. Um, this is kind of a couple of the workbooks that he had created um, to kind of give a better visualization of the uh, data that's flowing in and out of our, our research wing. Um, so on the left are, is just an award summary, um, on the right are expenses. Um, so pretty straightforward, um, but when he hired me, you know, one of the first things that we talked about is, you know, we, we can definitely, we can do better. Um, and that's kind of been our mantra, you know, every day is like, we feel like we can always do better. Um, and I'll go more into that, especially at the end. Um, so when I was hired on to, or not just UK, but with UK research, I knew almost nothing about the research uh, administration part of the business. Um, had no idea what an award was, what an expenditure was, um, how that all worked. Um, so for me, part of this process was really getting to know what I didn't know. And then also part of this process is understanding what we didn't know about how researcher staff and staff were using the existing reports and data. Um, and then we learned a lot through stakeholder interviews, um, just kind of sitting down with different groups, um, learning that you know, maybe they didn't even know that the, the first generation of our portal existed. Um, from there, we kind of like wanted to describe some of the technical problems they were facing. Um, for some, it would may have been that they didn't even have an account to our Tableau server instance. They didn't know how to get an account. Um, they didn't understand how to filter um, Tableau workbooks. Um, and I think this is largely a, a trap that a lot of people can get into with Tableau is, you know, once you've been using it a while, you just kind of make this assumption that everybody knows how to use it the way that you do. And it's it's 100% not true. Um, I know from a boss and I, we kind of consider ourselves much more advanced than some of the other groups on campus. Um, and we've just really had to kind of like scale back and kind of put our shoes in somebody who had never touched Tableau before, which was a great learning experience for us. Um, from there, we created a few um, prototypes and kind of like defined all of the functional and technical requirements that we uh, we kind of needed to hit on during our next, um, what we call our second 
version of the Tableau data portal or data portal. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to make sure that we listen to our customers and our customers are the internal uh, researchers that the executive leadership at UK, um, because if we're not listening to them again, you know, we're just assuming that they know things that maybe they don't know. Um, we're assuming that, you know, we know better than them. And then again, that's not always true. Um, so again, communication for us is a continuous process. We want to make it easy for people to give feedback. Um, we want to make it easy for people to report errors or bugs or ask questions about the data. Um, so this was our solution. So we went from our version one of the data portal to hosting it on our website. Um, and what you see right now is just our website. It's not the Tableau, obviously. Um, but one of the things we realized was that there weren't, there was some, a, a small subset of people that didn't even know Tableau server existed. Um, and then there were some even more users that felt like Tableau server was very clunky. So, it, and especially of a university of this size, and I'm sure there are some bigger ones where it can feel very overwhelming when you go into Tableau server and trying to sort through and find that workbook. Um, it, it just, it makes it to where you don't even want to dig in. So up here, we have our research analytics link. Um, when our users click on it, it brings them to a public facing dashboard. Give that a second. And hopefully Tableau Server isn't quirky like it was during our tech pre-check. There we go. And this just kind of gives everybody who's interested kind of like a very high level overview of our grants and project, grants and contract awards um, back to 2013. And then, um, really a brief overview of our um, expenditures in the NSF herd survey, um, which just tracks research expenditures across, uh, I believe the numbers were right around six to 800 some other institutions. Um, but we update our, um, our award data monthly and our expenditure data annually, we're working on getting that to monthly as well. And then um, the NSF herd data is updated annually. Usually in November, it was in December this last time because of COVID. But when our, us when our users come to this web page, they're presented with this dashboard. And then up here, we kind of highlighted a button that lets them access our data portal. Now, our data portal is basically a series of workbooks that are strung together um, using an interface that we created. Um, and the idea behind this is to keep people out of Tableau Server if they don't have to be in there. Um, I don't mean Tableau Server, you know, exactly, but I mean, keep them from having to browse around, try to figure out the workbook that they're looking for. Um, so this just kind of makes it easier. So when they click on there, they'll be presented with the option to log in, which I've already logged in. So hopefully, there we go. And then they get this table of contents. And this is everything in our data portal currently. Um, and this has evolved since we first launched it a couple of years ago. Um, and again, we're still evolving based on feedback and what we learned from our users. Um, so we have our proposal data that's updated daily. We have our award data updated monthly, expenditure data updated annually, and then additional workbooks that kind of like smaller groups use, but we wanted to make it easily accessible for them. Uh, we also have this free, frequently asked questions uh, link that takes you back to our webpage and users can get some of the answers to the common questions that we get. We also have these buttons on the bottom that we wanted to add to allow users to join our listserv and we use our listserv to provide updates in the data portal. So if we add a new workbook that might be useful to the broader group, we'll mention that. Um, they can also send an email, like both of these buttons here go to the same email, but it has different um, subject lines as you can see in the bottom uh, status bar. Um, but when they provide feedback, that email goes to our team. Um, up until probably, I think it was last March, we were a team of two um, or three, and now we're a team of four. So we are a very tiny team, but we are very efficient. Um, and that's something that we have a lot of pride in. Um, but something else we've noticed too, like during our research is not everybody wanted the wonderful, beautiful dashboards. We have those, and I'm gonna show you an example of that. And what we're going to see is our award summaries workbook. And again, this has basically the same consistent look and feel as the main table of contents. They still have the buttons on the bottom. Um, but what we call summaries are basically dashboards. We wanted to make it easy for users to understand um, because not everybody understood what a dashboard was. 
Um, this will show us um, just kind of general data on our awards. We have our monthly award summary, our award comparison by month. So we can see kind of where we were. So we want to see where we're in fiscal year 2019 as of February, we can do that and kind of compare over the years. Federal awards. And then our NIH awards and trends. Um, and I'm going to stop real quick. And if you have any questions at all about anything that I'm showing you um, or want to know how something was done, feel free to shoot me a, a message on LinkedIn or a message in our Slack group. And I'm more than happy to kind of answer to the best of my ability. Um, so again, we have our dashboards, or what are referred to as summaries, and our reports. Um, so again, we found a group, basically our financial users didn't really weren't really interested in the dashboards they kind of wanted their classic tabular reports that look like excel and we totally understand that you know that's still needed as wonderful as a product as tableau is you're always going to have those people who need cross tab format reports so for every dashboard that we have we basically have an unset role that you need to create a tabular format table um so that loads that provides users with the same data. So whatever they can answer using that dashboard, they generally need to be able to answer using the tabular format. Um, so even though there are more tabs up here at the top, um, it does answer all the questions that are generally asked by our summaries workbook. Um, kind of going back real quick, I just realized that I didn't touch on it. Um, on the start here page, uh, which is the starting page for most of our workbooks, you'll see that it says click on a report title or use the tabs below. The reason we added this uh, table of contents list is because during our meetings with users, we found that a lot of users didn't even know that these tabs at the top existed. So they knew how to get a Tableau server, they knew how to get to the workbooks that they were looking for, but beyond the first view that they looked at, they didn't know that anything else existed. So we were creating reports that people didn't know were out there, even though they know how to get to the workbook. Um, so again, this just comes with talking to your customers and trying to get an idea of where they are and put your feet, you know, in their shoes. Um, next, we have our expenditure summaries. And again, the same type of, you know, format and consistency. We don't, we don't want to confuse our users, users by changing things up um, between workbooks. The only big difference here is the color of the background. And that way, users can quickly know, oh, this is different than the award summaries. So it kind of like forces them to take a little bit of closer look if they're frequent users of our workbooks. So it's just a different shade of blue because, you know, we're UK and everything needs to be blue. Um, get through our expenditures. So again, some more expenditure dashboards. We have our federal dashboards. And then our F and A. Um, and in a nutshell, that is pretty much everything. Um, there are some other things that I really can't get into just because of uh, obviously data privacy. Um, and there are, are a couple of things that we went through in our Tableau conference session um, that might be useful. Um, but this is what we. Um, refer to as our research data portal. The big question now, though, is, you know, what's next? Um, so again, we, we kind of live by this mantra that we can always be improving what we're working on um, for our users. We are a very customer focused group. Um, and I th think that's something that I really love about everybody on our team is we kind of you know think about the impact of to our, on our customers. Um, so going through all these workbooks, um, something that we can definitely do better is make them more accessible, not just in terms of easier to find for users, but, you know, in terms of accessibility. Um, that's something that I didn't really have a, have a good grasp on when I started creating these. Um, that's something that I would love to uh, continue with our third iteration. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, in the next year or so, we'll be able to release our third iteration. Um, but kind of like in the back of my mind, something that I have planned is to go beyond just the color blindness. I'd love to be able to use a screen reader and test all of our um, dashboards that get published. Um, 
And then also back in uh, January, I actually left the University of Kentucky and then came back in August after I realized that consulting just, you know, it wasn't the thing for me. Um, but something that my boss and I talked about are just, you know, the sustainability of um, the workbooks, making sure that whoever touches them after me, because, you know, there will be a person after me, um, will know what I was thinking when I created a calculation or why certain decisions were made. Um, so from that aspect, I just want to start making more notes in the calculations, want to make it easier to use to, for somebody who may not be as familiar with Tableau, they can kind of at least go in and pick around and realize, oh, you know, I, I don't understand why they made that decision. Um, another thing is to automate as much as possible so there's less manual updates. Um, there's not too many manual updates that we do to the data portal right now, um, but that's just another kind of like focus that we like to have. Um, but other than that, that is our research data portal. Um, Again, my name is Alex Dixon. If you have any questions at all, feel free to shoot me a message in Slack, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I love questions. I love helping people. So yeah, that is it. So so Alex, since you yeah. opened the room for questions, we oh, got questions. Um, so there's there's sort of two two rounds of questions. There are two yeah. groups of questions. So one is around um, the where the data lives. So yeah. is and Baron already answered this in the in the chat, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. Baron's here. Just so we get it, you know, in 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 the transcript and in the video. Um, yeah. So how how is the 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 work split? Um, like, is it a public server? Is it on Tableau Public? Is it a, a separate site? Like, what what you display that that's sort of out there for people to get versus what might be internal? So the way our Tableau server is organized is we have every, a new project folder for every uh, college, pretty much every unit that uses Tableau. Um, all of our, our data is housed on a SQL server for research. We do use SAP HANA for more of the student and faculty data. Um, but as far as like the, the workbook that you're looking at now, that is on our Tableau server instance. And then the other workbook, this just has a guest access. And then the other workbooks after you log in um, are restricted to only UK users. Right. So, so Baron mentioned that you actually have two separate Tableau sites for it. one that is that public facing open right. to guest access version and then a completely different site for the stuff that is not open to the public. And I think right. a lot of a lot of schools do that for a lot of their institutional research stuff as well. Like they'll, they'll put the public facing stuff out on on either a separate site or at least provide guest access and then everything else is locked down. Right. Um, so the other question, and this is, it's sort of a, a list of questions is how do you, that, so that, that opening page, uh, if you could go back to sort of the, I want to call it the table of contents uh, type, yeah. type page. Um, how do you do that? <laughs> so again, my background is in graphic design and user experience, and I am on team float. Um, so everything's floating. Um, my the, the next version is going to be tiled just because it's going to make it easier for somebody who's not very familiar with coordinates and organizing layouts. Um, but this, the custom fonts, because Tableau doesn't support fonts, every single one of these buttons is an image. Um, and then this is all one gigantic background image. Uh, this is all an image because, again, Tableau doesn't support custom fonts. And as much as I would love to, to retain that in the next version, that's something that we're probably going to have to stop doing is creating everything as an image just because it does make it difficult um accessibility <laughs> yeah and, and again just you know just because i'm familiar with photoshop or figma or something like that doesn't mean the next person is um so just trying to keep things simple right it's it's all about helping future you and and your future colleagues or or uh, the people who are taking over after you right. stewarding stewarding your content so that someone else can can uh, can keep it going afterwards um so there is a question about Team Float since you since since you claimed claimed that allegiance. How does Team Float do with responsive or automatically sized dashboards? Um, so that's really hasn't been a focus for us, um, largely because people who view our workbooks um, are viewing them from their PCs or Mac MacBooks. Um, that is definitely something I'd love to kind of dig in a little bit more, especially for dashboards at a more executive level. Um, like you know, our, our president or vice president of research who may not be viewing on their computer, they might just want to pull it up on their phone really quickly. Um, so 
that that would it's definitely something that's we're being considered for our next version. So are, like all of these dashboards are built for a single size right now. Do you correct? Um, um, do you do you plan on using something like the the device designer to sort of get to that mobile view, or do you plan on just doing a completely different design for mobile? Or yeah. what what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> and I'd love to use the the device designer, um, but going into this, one of the big requirements, surprisingly. Um, was every dashboard we created, we need to make we need to have made sure that it had to be printed or be able to be printed on your standard sheet of paper. Um, that way, people can print off the dashboard, take it to a meeting, um, and you know, roll from there. So that was actually one of our, our really hard requirements when we started designing these, and that was something that was really hard for me, just kind of like mentally to kind of adapt to because, kind of you know, when you play around with um, dashboards in the, the you know the tableau community for different competitions and things there really isn't that limitation but when you start adding limitations to your work it really shows how creative you can be um and it, it kind of gives you a, a chance to kind of like push yourself um yeah you're, you're like how do you fit everything into this one small size of of piece of paper and you know make it something that people can still get get even without all of the interaction it's it's a right and, and you know i think iron race is a good example is you know you have a topic you run with it you choose your own data it gets exponentially harder when you're saying now the dashboard that you create has to be you know it has to fit on a single sheet of paper and not just fit on a single sheet of paper it basically take up the entire margin or you know now it has to be accessible like people need to be able to use a screen reader to view your dashboard yep there's so much, there's so much around accessibility. Yes. Um, if there is one thing that you would tell, uh, if you would tell past you about making this, this dashboard or this, this portal, mm -hmm. what would that be? What would you, what would you have done differently? Um, create it with other people in mind. Um, uh, when, when I first started playing with Tableau, I mean, I was absorbed in it. Uh, I created dashboards in my free time, uh, did all kinds of home budgeting stuff in it. I mean, it was just, it's like a new toy, it's fun. Um, and with that graphic design experience, I started doing things like, you know, adding images and things like that. I didn't think about, okay, when I leave the person after me, will they have that same skill set? And if they don't, how are they gonna update it? Um, so just to keep other people in mind, um, it's, it's really easy to with Tableau to kind of, you know, I don't know of any other word, but to kind of feel selfish <laughs> to say, you know, I like the way this looks, I like the way this reacts, but, when you start including other people in the conversation, um, it, it definitely kind of opens your eyes a little bit. Right. It's not just about your external users, like the people who are going to be using the dashboard. It's but it's also about the people who are going to be maintaining it. Whether you're there, I mean, it's it's there's always the the it may be that you know it needs da need up needs updates, but someone else on your team is going to have to update because you're otherwise occupied, right? Like so, even if right. you have no plans of leaving. <laughs> you know, it may not always be you supporting that one dashboard. So yeah, and especially about... you know, in the time of COVID, you know, God forbid I'm out a week, two weeks with COVID and somebody else has to update it. And well, now it's up to them to, you know, change, you know, an image if they don't, you know, know how to do that. Yeah. Um, we've got one more quick question. Um, yeah. So the printability requirement, did that drive the font choice um, behind uh, the this page that we're looking at? So UK is really big on brand standards and requirements, and that drove the font choice. Um, as far as the things like our charts um, and up here where it says total awards, that's something that I am definitely going to improve is just the size of the fonts, um, because while it may look OK, it's harder for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the, the custom fonts, that was driven entirely by our brand standards. And that's, you know, not to kind of harp on this, but that's something I really wish we could do in Tableau is, you know, embed custom fonts. Right. Is there, I mean, when, when you guys do update this to not no longer use images, do you plan on saying, sorry, brand, brand owners, uh, we can't, we can't do this. We're going to, we're going to go with Tableau defaults, or we're going to go with something that we know that renders well, um, in Tableau, or are you still going to, do you think that you're still going to be stuck with those, those font requirements? No, I, I, they're not really requirements for us. It's just kind of like we wanted to build around the brand. Right. Um, but we'll probably just roll with your standard Tableau, regular, semi-bold type of thing um, and just kind of see what happens. Again, so some of those, those limitations, the world is open, but 
sometimes <laughs> sometimes you gotta be limited by the tool as well. So Tableau Tableau server just won't won't take those fonts. So you right. you roll with it, right? Awesome. That was really great. Um, I think there's still a few more questions that we didn't get to in the chat. Um, so take a look in the chat. Uh, and if you want to move any conversations to Slack, feel free to do that. Um, I'm sure people are have have lots of cool questions to ask about this. So thank you, Alex. And thank you, Baron, for manning the chat <laughs> a little bit for us. Thanks, Baron. All right. And then we are going to move on if I can find my Slack or my, my, uh, there we go. There we go. You guys see my screen now. <laughs> yep. You're good. All right. Well, we would like to invite you to tell us what you thought of today's meeting by filling out the form and the link that I just posted in the chat box and also go ahead and register for February's meeting, which is going to be on February 17th from three o'clock to four 30 Eastern. Both of those links are in the chat box. And if you if you want to present at the February <laughs> meeting or be asked a whole bunch of questions in the Media Community Member Spotlight, let us know. Absolutely. We are actively uh, looking for speakers for the entire year, really. So if you want to go ahead and like, you know, your June is going to be a little bit empty or your, you know, your summer's looking like it's gonna be a little bit more free than usual. We can go ahead and put you on the schedule. Uh, here are some more important links that we like to share out every month, our site, our email. That's if you need to reach all the co-leads at once, higheredtug at gmail.com, our Slack channel, our higher ed community forum, and our higher ed tug on Tableau public page, which still don't have a whole lot of this um, is up for that yet, but. We need to get back on that. All right, so next up, we're going to have our breakout rooms and I'll let Roshni explain how those are going to work. <laughs> 